In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Uh, my message today is a simple one. I'm going to use our epistle, and I want to point out three of the themes from our epistle in the beginning of Ephesians 5. And the goal is that uh, in looking at these three themes, uh, we would be able to be a better a witness for our Lord Jesus Christ uh, in the world around us. And to get into chapter 5, I think it's good to look at the last few words in chapter 4. The theme here uh, that the Apostle gives us is love, and he contrasts that with a love that isn't love, but a counterfeit love. So chapter 4 ends like this. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as Christ in God forgave you. And then so chapter 5 begins, Christ forgave you, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice unto God. Paul gives us an example of how we are to live. God is love and has shown his love to us in the person, life, ministry, and sacrifice on the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we should also love and walk in a life of love. But this isn't the kind of love, we've talked about love many times, this isn't the kind of love in the popular music song. This is the kind of love that is self-sacrificing. It is the kind of love that a child shows for their elderly parent with dementia, taking care of them. It is the kind of love that a brother shows for his brother who has Down syndrome by caring for him for decades. It's the kind of love uh, that a parent shows uh, for their children by going off to work every day at a job they hate so that they can take care of them and feed them. And when we think of the life of the Christian, should we be surprised at the great prominence given to love? Well, we just read the summary of the law a few minutes ago. What did it say? Love God and love your neighbor, right? Much of what follows in the epistle lesson, chapter 5, is something of a list of do's and don'ts, behaviors and actions and speech that are not consistent with walking in the life of love, self-sacrificing love of a Christian, words and actions that are not consistent with how we should live. So if sacrificial love is the lifestyle of the Christian, then selfish sensuality, counterfeit love, is its opposite. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul puts in his target. Sexual immorality, illicit sexual activity, and all impurity, corrupt sexual activity, covetous greed, coveting your neighbor's wife. All of these things, the Apostle minces no words. He says this. <coughs> Verse 5. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God and Christ. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience, those, those who are habitually sinning. Therefore, do not become partakers or partners with them. So the whole life of the Christian is to be one that exhibits self-sacrificing love. The Father's love was shown for us in the sweet-smelling sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because we are his children, his children by adoption, we should also be about self-sacrificing love. That is our family tradition, self-sacrificing love. Not counterfeit love, selfish sensuality. Counterfeit love, worldly lusts, are not characteristic of our family and should not be part of our walk. So that's the first section, the comparison between love and counterfeit love. 
The second section, uh, or the second theme that I want to highlight is followers of God, worshipers of God, and those who worship idols, idolaters. This passage is also about worship. It is said that uh, what we worship, we become. In verse 2, we see Christ offering himself, giving himself, sacrificing himself. These are actions of worship, sacrifice, giving, sacrificing. In verse 4, as opposed to offering ourselves to sexual uncleanness and impurity, we are directed to give thanks, Eucharistia. What do, what do we call this? The giving of thanks, our service, we call it the Eucharist, right? In verse 5, Paul explicitly says that these things that he lists out are false worship or idolatry. That's not how we normally think about these things, but that's what the apostle says. He says, for you know this, that no whoremonger, fornicator, nor unclean or impure person, or covetous, lustful man, who is an idolater. It seems a little strange to us. How is this? It's because when we serve these lusts of the flesh, when that is what consumes our thoughts and our actions, we make it a false god. We have replaced the true god with something else. Paul says, be not, be not therefore partakers with them. That is the children of disobedience. And then verse 11, he says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. But this is interesting because when he talks about being in fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, not to be in fellowship with them, uh, that is, we are not to be in union with these things, not to be in communion with these things. Again, go back to the words of worship, which obviously contrasts with having communion with God in Christ. There's an element of worship here contrasted with idolatry. Worship of the true God is contrasted with idolatry and the pursuits of flesh and lust. What we worship determines what we become. If your time, energy, and thought revolves around the unclean things, then you are an idolater, a worshiper, of a false god. If instead we engage in self-sacrificing love and sacrifice of thanksgiving, the fruit of our lips, giving praise to God, then we are followers of God and followers of Christ. True love and true worship has been contrasted with counterfeit love and idolatry. So those are the first two things I wanted to point out. And the final is light versus darkness. There's a you go through your Bible and start highlighting the words where he's talking about likeness and darkness here, uh, you'll see he does this over and over in this passage. So he would contrast likeness and darkness, spiritual light and darkness. He says, for you were sometimes, for you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. All things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Christ shall give you light. Now these things which he has told us are, are uh, now considered in terms of light and darkness. Same, same topic, but now we're looking at these things in terms of light and darkness. All forms of sexual activity outside marriage, shameful talk, shameful thoughts, these are all characteristic of those who live in spiritual darkness. He's writing to the Christians in Ephesus so he can say, you were once in darkness, in the darkness of the Gentiles, but now you've been made children of light. Christ gives you light. In the presence of the Lord, we are in light. Christ gives us light. We are to live as people who are God's children. So we are children of light, not darkness. The works of darkness, all those things he's listed out, are contrary to God's design, and so they are fruitless. They will not bear any good thing because they're not good for us. In fact, their fruitlessness is even exposed by the light. And this is the thought I want to finish with today. In verse 14 it says, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepeth, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Who is the he that is saying this? 
And where did he say it? Those are good questions. He's, he's obviously referring back to something else. What is it? It's not from here in this passage. Um, what he's actually referring to is he's referring back to a prophecy in Isaiah. Shouldn't be surprised. Sometimes Isaiah is called the Gospel of Isaiah because there's so many prophecies of Christ in it. Uh, Jesus himself, when he preached in the synagogue, used a section from Isaiah as his text. So Isaiah 61 says this, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of thy Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Talking about Israel. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Again, we see this contrasting of light and darkness, just like the Apostle Paul's doing. The world is dark, and the Gentiles out there live in darkness. But you, Israel, you will reflect the light of God, and the Gentiles will be drawn to you. And so that's my uh, final thought for you, and that is evangelistic in nature. When you walk in love, when you worship the true God, you reflect the light of your Father. And in doing so, you become a magnet to those who are in darkness. As a Christian, you should have a heart for the lost. Would you like to be able to be a good testimony to those who you work with so that they might be drawn to Christ? What about your family and members that don't know Christ? Wouldn't you like to draw them to Christ? What about those in the community that you interact with? But wouldn't you like to draw them to Christ? The way to do that is to live in love, faithfully worship the true God, not those things which are unfruitful. Walk in love as Christ also hath loved.